Okay. So good morning once again. I hope you had a good weekend. Um, just as, like I said last time, we are going to do acute sinusitis. This is a, supposed to be a, a lecture done by Dr. Victoria, um, but I'm going to do it for her. And I hope at least a majority of you were able to access the study material at least before. I think that would help um, in terms of things that you did not understand and you can ask questions as we go along or at the very end, whichever is more convenient for you. Okay. So acute sinusitis. Um, uh, this is going to be our basic outline. We shall define what acute sinusitis is then we'll be able to classify sinusitis, um, to, to talk about the etiology, the presentation, then the tests that you can do to diagnose it, how you treat a patient you diagnose with acute sinusitis, and then how you are able to monitor them and follow them up. And finally, the complications associated with acute sinusitis. So by definition, acute sinusitis, these are signs and symptoms of um, an infectious process that is less than three weeks um, of duration. Uh, but you can also have what is subacute and what is chronic. So the difference between acute and subacute, for subacute, you have the signs and symptoms for more than three weeks. That is between 21 days to 60 days. And if it's beyond, if the symptoms go beyond 60 days, then, then we consider that um, chronic. Or if someone has had episodes, four episodes of acute sinusitis, which all are um, more than 10 days in a single year, then we consider that person to be having chronic sinusitis. So what causes or what leads to chronic sinusitis for someone who has been with acute and then they come up with chronic sinusitis? So um, examples of um, causes could be resistant infectious organisms. For example, if you're having resist resistant microorganisms, bacteria, you give your antibiotics and they're actually not working. So the patient ends up with chronic sinusitis. Um, then cases where we have underlying systemic illnesses, for example, diabetes, we know that these people in particular have an impaired immune system, um, immune response. So for these, they are more prone to get in chronic sinusitis, despite giving the appropriate medication necessary. Um, and then also the case of immunodeficiency, still this has to do with the impaired immune response to the illness. And then for people who have had um, irreversible mucosal changes, we know that um, the nose is able to clean itself um, via, the, via movement of the cilia along the mucosal lining. So when people have either trauma or because of certain medications that impair the movement of these cilia, so they are, then they're unable to clear the mucosal secretions, these people are prone to getting chronic sinusitis compared to any other individual. And um, if someone has anatomical abnormalities, that means um, where the meatus is supposed to be, there are some issues, then this affects the drainage of the sinuses. We were able to look at the anatomy of the sinuses in the previous lecture. So if there are any abnormalities, still these people will be prone to getting um, to, to get in chronic sinusitis. So the incidence is reported to be more than 30 million cases in the US. Um, our incidence here, well, we, we most of the times we don't have the, the data. Um, all people who do the studies have not published, so we may not have that here, but we end up using data from other countries. 
So you find that the most, it's the most common chronic illness. Um, and 17% of the patients are older than age 65. Um, so this may also occur between 0.5 to 1% of all upper respiratory tract infections. So that means there are other causes um, this, um, apart from sinusitis. So when you look at the pathogenesis of sinusitis, um, we find that the commonest cause is because of osteo obstruction or blockage. We know that the sinuses are drained via the ostea, the openings that lead to the nasal cavity. So for cases where you, those ostea are obstructed, that means the sinus is not able to empty. Um, and this uh, creates stasis with the mucosal secretions. And of course, when you have stasis, then the higher chances of bacterial overgrowth. So you end up with an infection. So that is what I've stated here, sinus ostea occluded, and then you have um, colonizing bacteria replicating, causing an infection. And sometimes the ostea is open, but you have ciliary dysfunction. That, that means um, they're not moving in the right way. Usually cilia beat um, in one direction to move the secretions. So if they are not moving properly, then the secretions are retained within the sinus and this causes an infection later on. Um, you can also have mucosal edema. Um, still the mucosal edema ends up closing the ostea. So it's not able to be drained. So just a recap about the sinuses. We have here the, these, were, these are the frontal sinuses. And in between here, should be having the ethmoid sinuses. These are the, this and this is the maxillary sinus. So when you look at the sagittal view, this is your frontal sinus. Um, these are the ethmoid sinuses. And then this is the maxillary sinus. We are able to see the sphenoid on this other image here because it's, it's more posterior here. Yeah. So you find that they all have openings the frontal sinus, maxillary sinus, and the ethmoids all open into the middle meatus. So if there's anything that, that is causing obstruction of that meatus or the ostea, it's prone to cause you um, infection in the sinus, <clears throat> in the frontal, the ethmoid, and the maxillary. So for, for the sphenoid, uh, usually it opens in the sphenoethmoidal recess. So if there's anything causing obstruction there, then you're prone to get an infection in, in the sphenoid as well. So these are the most common organisms that um, causing infection in the sinuses when we consider um, bacterial causes. We have both anaerobic and aerobic bacteria. And for the aerobic bacteria, as you can see, we have strep pneumonia, which is the most common. Then you could have alpha and beta hemolytic streptococcus. You have staph aureus. Um, you have hemophilus. You have E. coli. For the anaerobes, which is usually 10%. Um, of the acute infection, but they are more prone to causing chronic infection. You have the Peptostreptococcus species, the Propionobacterium, Bacteroides, and then Fusobacterium. So aside from bacteria, you can also have um, viruses causing um, sinusitis and as well as fungi causing sinusitis. So what could predispose one person to get sinusitis? These are just some of the things. We have local, local causes, for example, an upper respiratory tract infection. Um, if someone has allergy issues, if they have allergic rhinitis, then there are higher chances of getting an episode or episodes of acute sinusitis. Um, someone who has nasoceptor defects, for example, if they have a septal deviation, um, you find that one, the side that is more narrowed by the deviation will have a higher chance of developing sinusitis. 
in, in that uh, you're more likely to have um, meato obstruction, so the sinuses on that side are unable to drain. Um, effects of barrel trauma, foreign bodies in the nose, uh, tubes, if you have an NG tube in the nose, these are all, um, all sort of obstructing the outflow of the sinuses. Um, if someone has dental infection, and for example, for the dental infection, it's usually uh, for the maxillary sinuses because they are, um, if we are to go back to our previous picture, um, you can see the teeth here and, or maybe this one, this one is better. So you have the your teeth very being very close to the sinuses. At times you can have these teeth, the roots of the teeth um, going up to the sinus and they're just covered by the mucosa. So if you have an infection, it can easily trap. If you have a dental infection for any of these teeth, it can easily trap into the sinus and you end up with a sinusitis as well. So the other things are the overuse of topical decongestants, um, nasal polyps or tumors, then aspiration of infected water, smoking. Um, smoking basically interferes with the um, ciliary movement, so you're unable to clear your sinuses. So the other, the, that, what we're talking about was the local causes, but we have the systemic as well. Um, if someone has diabetes, remember we talked about the in, impaired immune response, so that they're, they're prone to getting um, many infections apart from just sinusitis. So sinusitis is one of them. So any immune compromised individual, if they have HIV um, and probably it's, um, Poor staging, they, were, they are prone to getting sinusitis. They had a higher chance compared to other individuals. Um, then malnutrition, uh, blood dyscrasia, cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis, you have impaired, still you have impaired um, ciliary movement. Those that have been on chemotherapy, it's due to impaired immune response. Um, the same applies to long-term steroid treatment. So the, the usual clinical presentation for someone who has acute sinusitis, um, they may have symptoms that progress over two to three days, and these include um, uh, nasal congestion or discharge. This may be thick, colored, or it could actually be clear. This really depends on the causative organisms. If it's bacteria, it's most likely to be purulent. Um, if it's viral, it's usually a clear, a clear discharge. They could have localized pain um, over the sinuses. If you are to palpate over where the different sinuses are located um, on the face, you, you end up with tenderness or pressure sensation over those particular sinuses. They could have a headache, um, they could have a cough because these, these are secretions. Um, these secretions sort of drop back uh, and you have a post-nasal drip. So uh, when, when, they, when they're, they're still in the firing, someone can cough them up. Um, you could also have halitosis and then malaise. So um, when you examine all the physical findings, when you examine a patient who has a, a sinusitis, acute sinusitis, um, in the nasal cavity, you find erythematous or edematous nasal mucosa. You could find purulent secretions in the middle meato area. Like we've said, most of the sinuses um, drain in the middle meatus. So, you, you, you find purulent secretions there. Though, if actually the meatus is, or the ostia is blocked, you may not have any discharge because there's nowhere the, the secretions can trap from. You could have percussion tenderness of the, the involved sinuses. Um, and then particularly for the maxillary sinus, if um, the infection is coming from a dental issue, or even if it's not from a dental issue, you could actually have 
pain or premolar teeth pain. Uh, the other thing that we talked about is the halitosis and fever. Okay, so uh, what are the pain patterns of someone with acute sinusitis? So basically, the pain is usually over the over the sinus that is affected. Uh, for the maxillary sinus, you have unilateral pain over the cheekbone, you could have maxillary toothache, you, have, you could have maxillary pain, you could have a temporal headache. Um, and this pain is usually worse if the head is upright, but the person or the patient feels better when they lie, when they lie supine. So you have to pay attention to these, um, these presentations of the patient and they could be able to tell you which sinus is affected, whether it's one particular sinus or all of them uh, being affected by the sinusitis. If it's an ethmoid sinusitis, you have um, medial canthal pain, um, periobital or tempo, tem temporal headache. Um, and this pain is usually worsened by the valsava or if the person is supine. Then for sphenoiditis, you have retroorbital pain, temporal, temporal, <clears throat> temporal pain, headache, I mean, um, or a vertical headache. And then often it's a deep-seated headache with multiple foci. Usually the pain is worse when someone is supine or bending forward. For a frontal sinusitis, um, you have a frontal headache and pain is worse when the patient is supine. But all these, um, these you'd get these particular pains if it is one sinus. You may have a case where more than one sinus is affected. So you find that there, there's pain in different areas of the head or of the face, depending which particular sinuses are affected. So this is just to demonstrate um, which, uh, the different sinuses and where the pain could be. For the frontal, you have the frontal headache and then the temporal, temporal headache. Uh, when it comes to maxillary, you can still have the temporal headache. You could still have pain over the cheek. You have pain over, you have pain in the teeth. So depending on where or what sinuses are affected, you have different, different locations of pain and and headache. So for the sphenoid, you find that it's more deep seated. The person may not be able to localize where, or it's 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 in the occiput. So it all depends on which sinuses are affected. So when um when uh someone gets acute sinusitis, what are we most worried about? These are the complications that could come with the sinusitis. Um and these are things that you could find out or you could examine the patient and they let you know that there's something wrong, there's something more than just a sinusitis going on. So if the patient has a has periorbital, frontal, or cheek edema then you're concerned, you should be more concerned. This is not just a simple sinusitis, there's much more than that. If they have proptosis, if they have ophthalmoplegia, that means they have abnormal eye movement or what you call a lazy eye. If you have ptosis, um, diplopia, then you you should be more worried. Um, if they have meningeal signs or if they have neuro deficits, for cranial nerve two to two to six, then you should be more worried that the, it's not just a simple sinusitis. You have complications. So um, part of the test that you can do to to determine or to diagnose your acute sinusitis. Um, previously, we used to use uh, plain films, but with the with the CT scan coming up, it's it's more sensitive compared to plain radiograph. Because for plain radiographs, you can't really be able to distinguish between um, 
if the sinus is fully covered up, you cannot be able to tell between an, an infection causing inflammation or a tumor. You can't really tell them apart. So it's with, with the CT, if a patient can do a CT scan, when and good, it would give us better, better results. So for the radiological signs of sinus pathology, we could have air fluid levels where you have partial or complete opacification of the sinus. You could have bony wall displacement. Um, and then you could also have mucosal thickening. Um, this is usually four millimeters or more. This you can be able to tell in a CT scan. So for the plain radiographs, you usually use the <clears throat> you use the cardwell waters or the submental vertex views to tell you the different sinuses. So this image is a um, is a um, is a waters view, and you can be able to see this is the nasal cavity. You can see the septum here. So this is um, this is the right nasal cavity and the left nasal cavity. So that means this is the right maxillary sinus, and then this is the left maxillary sinus. But if you compare the right with the left, you have an air fluid level here in the left. So that that tells you that there's there's fluid, there's some form of fluid in the left maxillary sinus. So remember, we say that with the, with the sinusitis, you have either blockage in the ostia, so these fluids are not able to drain, or inflammation. So for this particular one, we are seeing air fluid levels. So it tells us we have a left maxillary sinusitis, according to that X-ray. Um, when you look at this image, you can see the frontal sinus. Frontal sinus is there here. This is the nasal cavity. But when it comes to the maxillary sinuses, they are not really, you can't see them very well. And this is because of mucosal thickening here, mostly in the, mostly in the, in, in the, in the left sinus. And then, well, this is not so clear, but we have an air fluid level in the right. So it tells you this person has a maxillary sinusitis, which is bilateral, because here the frontal sinuses seem to be clear. It's only the maxillary sinuses that we are able to see that have um, some pathology in them. So for this particular patient, we can be able to see the frontal sinus here. This should be the sphenoid sinus and the maxillary somewhere here. So this is lateral view. For the lateral view, that's where you're able to see the ethmoid sinuses here and the frontal as well. Anyway, so from what we've discussed, can anyone tell us if we have an air fluid level anywhere? And if yes, where is it? Ah. Yes, please. Yes, I think it's in the right maxillary sinus. Okay, yeah, so it's quite obvious. When you compare this, when you compare the left and then the right, you can see that the air is much smaller. And then you have this, which is like a meniscus. So you have an air fluid level here in the right maxillary sinus. Thank you very much. So, um, So you have in this image, this is where you're supposed to be having um, the pneumatization for the frontal sinuses, but then there's haziness, so there's opacification here. So for this patient in particular, you talk about the frontal sinusitis. Other than that, well, this should be the nasal cavity, but the frontals are, and are opacified, so we think they have so there are also other images for you to look at um, as you read so that you can be able to tell which, which where the 
air fluid levels are, where the opacification is, yes, as you revise. So like I said, for the plain film, it's not the best, it has limitations. And this is because of poor visualization, you can't be able to see the ethmoid air cells very well. Then, like I said prior, you cannot be able to distinguish between infection, yeah. tumor. Yeah. Uh, is Opoka saying yeah. something? Okay, let's go on. So you, you cannot be able to distinguish between infection, tumor, or polyp in a sinus if the sinus is completely opacified. So you will not be having the air fluid level. You just have opacification, but you cannot be able to ascertain what exactly it is. So um, apart from the plain X-ray, uh, you have what we call the nasal endoscopes, and these ones help you to directly visualize um, within the nasal cavity. You're able to look at the, the different meatus, and then you're also able to look into some of the sinuses, depending on whether the patient is awake or um, under anesthesia. So they, they have different degrees. We have a zero degree, 30 degrees, 70 degrees. These basically just help you to to view different angles um, within the nasal cavity. So this can be done as an office procedure or it could be done um, in theater when the patient is under anesthesia. So the other test that we talked about is the CT scan. And this one is uh, of more advantage because you're able to look at the ethmoid air cells. Um, then you're also able to evaluate the cause of the opacified sinuses, whether it's tumor, it's a solid tumor, or it's a polyps, or if it's just fluid that is completely filling the sinus. Um, and it's able to distinguish or differentiate bony changes of chronic inflammation from those that are caused by just um, um, bony changes for chronic inflammation causing an osteomyelitis or those that are caused by tumor. Um, and it's only indicated because if there are any complications or if you're suspecting complications in a patient. Why? Because um, one, the cost and then also exposure. Um, exposure for the patient. So for, for this one, this is an axial cut. This is, um, this should be the anterior cranial fossa, but still you, you can be able to see the frontal sinuses here. And you can see that there's air and then there's opacification. So this could be fluid with some air inside the sinuses. This is both for the, the right and the left frontal sinuses. Um, for this one in particular, it's looking at the, this is just sphenoid, sphenoid sinuses. This is, this is, you find that there's opacification of this particular sinus. Um, here we're looking at the maxillary still. This one is completely opacified compared to, to, the, to, the, to the left one. So um, when you diagnose a patient with sinusitis, with acute sinusitis, uh, your goals for therapy usually are to control infection and then to facilitate first, I mean, sinus osteopathy patency so that the, whatever is in the sinus can be able to drain out and also provide relief of symptoms. If someone has come with pain, you should be able to relieve the pain. And also if, they're having a running nose, you're trying to dry, to dry it. Um, and also be able to evaluate and treat any predisposing condition so that um, you're not having recurrent, recurrent um, sinusitis if, if there are any things that can lead to chronic sinusitis. We saw that particular people are more prone to getting um, chronic infections. So you should be able to evaluate for this and you deal with them 
and prevent them from getting future infections that are unnecessary. So usually for treatment, um, we talk of different causes um, of the sinusitis. So for the case where it is bacterial, we usually give oral antibiotics. Um, you could give topical systemic decongestant. Uh, you give pain medication. And then um, uh, you could also combine it with uh, uh, warm nasosaline irrigations, antihistamine. Um, this is usually for particularly important in cases where there are patients that have issues with allergy. And then you could also give steroid nasal doctor sprays. This is as well to reduce mucosal, mucosal, mucosal edema or for cases where someone has nasal polyps. So this helps in reduction in size of the polyps. So for, for the antibiotic therapy, um, usually the treatment duration is between 10 to 14 days. Um, although in, in the recent studies, if you give three days, it's still for a potent uh, medication, it could still be okay. And uh, medications that are usually first line, you have amoxicillin or augmentin. Augmentin is a combination of amoxicillin and clavulinic acid. Or you could give a um, trimethoprim with a sulfamethoxazole, azithromycin, pediazole. Um, because you may not be able to give children azithromycin, you could combine, there's a combination between um, erythromycin and sulfixoxazole, which is a QID um, medication. So for, for this alternative, it's usually for patients that have failed with the first line. And here you're considering um, cephalosporins. You could use cefroxine, you could use cefrozil, cefpodoxine. This cefpodoxine could help you with patients that have failed to choose with the first line medication. So in combination with the with the, um, your antibiotics, you could use topical decongestant decongestant. Uh, for example, those that contain ephedrine sulfate, phenylephrine, or oxymetazoline. Although with using the topical decongestant, we have to be very careful to limit use between three to five days. Otherwise, there are higher chances of rebound vasodilatation. And with this, the patient will get what we call rhinitis medicamentosa. This is because they're getting the rhinitis as a result of using your topical decongestant. So it's like um, they have a running nose, they have nasal blockage, um, and this is as a result of the medicine that you give them. So you have to ensure that the treatment you're giving doesn't exceed those um, those days. Otherwise, you'd have a problem. Um, so if a patient has um, particularly frontal sinusitis without other, other sinuses being involved, um, because of the the proximity of the frontal sinus and the brain and the anterior cranial fossa, usually would prefer these patients to be at least admitted for an initial IV antibiotic treatment. Uh, because with the frontal sinus sinusitis, you are the higher incidence of intracranial complications, which could be fatal for the patient if not managed in time or appropriately. So you, for the initial IV antibiotic, you could give IV cefuroxin, which is two grams, eight hourly, or cefriaxone, which is once a day, and decongestants as well. And if there are no changes within 24 to 48 hours, in order to prevent further, or to prevent complications, this patient may actually need a surgical intervention to drain that sinus. So you have some procedures that can be done um, 
for example, external semi-sectomy, uh, basically to try and drain that pus before it can cause any complications or trap into the anterior cranial fossa. So that is basically it for the bacteria. So we shall look at the fungal sinusitis. It has an increasing incidence for both immune competent and compromised patients. And usually you have three types. The fulminant um, infection of soft tissue invasion. Um, this is like an acute form, or you could have that that is progressive, um, a progressive indolent invasive disease. And then the, the third one is the non-invasive localized disease. The non-invasive localized disease is usually in one sinus. You find it's only one sinus affected, um, which in most cases is the maxillary sinus um, and without affection on the opposite side. So the common causative organisms, you have aspergillus, which is um, the most common cause. Uh, you could have rhizopus, candida, histoplasma, um, all those mentioned. So for a person who has invasive acute fulminant sinusitis, um, they usually have facial soft tissue tenderness. They could have cloudy rhinorrhea, fever. And when you look into their nasal cavity, they usually have real friable um, nasal tissue, which um, lacks sensation, so it's painless. Um, they could have necrotic black tissue in the nasal cavity, and they could also have bloody rhinorrhea. Uh, so this is a picture which may not be so clear, but you have um, you have a necrotic lesion that is you you that was with in in the nasal cavity, but as well as came out on the surface of the um, of the nose. So it was necrotic. When this was taken for biopsy, um, they were they found high fee. So when you find high fee, that is definitely pointing to fungus. Um, and when you do culture, you're able to tell which particular fungi it is or fungus, whatever. So the treatment, um, because of the likelihood of complications with fungal sinusitis, these patients are always admitted. And um, you have to look for, because the most commonly affected are those that have, um, those that have other comorbidities. So you have to correct metabolic abnormalities. And then usually the treatment of choice is IV, um, high dose amphobic, amphotericin B or fluconazole, plus or minus fluconazole. And then you have to debride um, the affected tissue or the necrotic tissue so that you leave only the live tissue. Otherwise, whatever medication you're giving, IV will not be able to work if you've not removed the necrotic tissue. So the general management of complications, we have hospitalization, then you have to do a CT scan so that you're able to determine which sinuses are affected and how badly they're affected, and also to look for um, tracking of, of infection elsewhere, for example, intracranially, um, in the orbit, yes, depending on which sinuses are affected. Then for the antibiotics you give, you should also have an aerobic coverage and these patients should be seen by an ENT to ensure that um, all is well with them. So um, for the complications of the acute sinusitis, um, the complications could be um, local, intracranial, or it, it could be generalized complications. So for the Local complications, we have the mucosil or the mucopiosil. And this is basically when the sinus is sealed off. So that means the secretions are not being drained. So they keep accumulating. And depending on which sinus um, is affected, you could have, you could end up with a, a mass, um, which can be seen on the outside 
or you see it in the nasal cavity. And this is usually for the mucosal, it's used, it's, it's, it's basically um, the mucosal secretions or the, that mucoid secretion. When it, it's the mucopiosil, that means it's infected and then it's, it's like pus. Uh, you could also have osteomyelitis, um, you could have fasciocellulitis, you could have an oral antrofistula. Basically, you have an, a fistula connecting the, the sinus with the oral cavity. So this usually occurs for the maxillary sinus. Um, you could have orbitocellulitis um, intracranially, you could have a cavernous sinus thrombosis, um, you could have a septic thrombophlebitis, you could have a meningitis, a durus, a and intracranial, um, intracerebral brain, basically the brain abscess. So for the case where you have complications, that means basically your treatment is IV, IV medication. Uh, you could use the cephalosporin, ceftriaxone, cefotaxin, and this is combined with the um, metronidazole, anaerobic cover, metronidazole, which is you can give at 30 milligrams per kilogram per day, which could be in divided doses for the patient. Or the other option, you could give a combination of ampicillin and sarbactam or vancomycin. So how do you follow up a patient who has had acute sinusitis? For example, if you've given medication and it has not resolved within the 10 days, um, then you have to consider in increasing, um, giving them antibiotics for the next three weeks. Still, if you've given the medication for the three weeks and, and they are still not resolved, then you have to do further workup to rule out any complications and you have to do a CT scan or you have to do cultures from the sinus. Um, uh, so there are also other antibiotics that you can consider, which is clindamycin, ciprofloxacin, and metronidazole. For the case where you have resistance, bacterial resistance. And then you could as well as consider topical intranasal steroids. Um, these ones are supposed to help you with, um, in case there are any, any polyps, they are supposed to cause shrinkage of those polyps and then the medications get where they're supposed to go. So our summary, basically, um, we diagnose acute sinusitis with clinical presentation, that means from the history and then your examination findings. And when you diagnose acute sinusitis, you should be able to evaluate the patient for complications. And if there are any complications, then the patient needs to be admitted at hospital. Um, the treatment for acute sinusitis without complications is usually 10 to 14 days, but you may have to extend treatment if, um, if the patient has not resolved within 10 days. Yeah. So that is it. Any questions, reactions are welcome. Yes, doctor, thank you so much. There were some questions in group. Okay. In the chat. Fintumanja had two questions. Two questions. How do blood dyscrasias predispose one to sinusitis and what causes the opacification? Okay, so I will start with the opacification. Like we talked yes. about before, opacification could be either mucosoidema within the sinus. So you're not able, because sinuses are supposed to be filled with air. So if you have opacification, um, that means the air, there's no air. So it could be mucosoidema, it could be fluid within the sinus, or it could be actually um, a soft tissue mass that would cause the opacification. So um, the blood dyscrasia, because this basically you have abnormalities or abnormal cells within the blood, you find that in most cases, 
they also have an impaired immune response as well. So that is how the blood dysphagia cause, um, can lead to someone getting sinusitis. Yes, we have more questions in the chat. Colin was saying, what drugs cause mucosal cilia changes? I beg your pardon? What drugs cause mucosal cilia changes from Colin? Which, which drugs? Yes. Which drugs cause mucosal ciliary changes? Yes. Uh, I think you you can try and research about that, but the things that cause mucosal ciliary changes that may not particularly be drugs is, for example, the habit of smoking. Um, smoking impairs the movement of the, the movement of the cilia. So you're unable to, you're unable to, to clear the sinuses. Uh, the drugs that cause, for example, what we talked about was the, the topical decongestants. This basically cause um, rebound edema. If you're using for longer than five days, you have rebound edema. And of course, if there is edema, then the, the cilia is, an, is not doesn't move properly and the chances of an infection or a chronic infection are higher okay doctor we have another question from Bire. doctor how do we manage causal edema or hypertrophy with complete occlusion and loss doctor how do we manage mucosal edema or hypertrophy with complete occlusion and loss of sense of smell. Okay, so when someone has um, congestion, hypertrophy, edema, um, it could be an acute cause, like an acute infection, acute sinusitis. Um, it could it could be an allergic reaction. Uh, so depending on what the cause has been, for the case of an allergic reaction, um, you could consider use of uh, topical steroids um, for the patient combined with other antihistamines or um, things like Montelukast. For someone who has had an infection, um, because when, when it's an infection, we expect that it's a uh, an acute thing or a short-term thing, there you consider using decongestants for a short period of time. Then okay. loss of sense of smell, it could be because of the edema, it could also have because of other things. So if it's just because of the edema, when you use the decongestants, it should be able to be sorted out. But if you have other causes of, um, of of the loss of sense of smell. For example, if someone had trauma, head trauma, or if you have tumor, then those ones should be managed independently. For tumor, you may have to, to, to do surgery depending on what tumor it is or use other treatment modalities. Uh, we have more questions coming in, doctor. Okay. So this is from how would we differentiate acute sinusitis from allergic rhinitis from the, the clinical presentation, especially the viral sinusitis where the rhinorrhea is also clear? So that still comes with the, it, it still comes out from your history. For allergic rhinitis or allergic sinus, allerg, um, allergic rhinosinusitis, you find that there's a trigger, whatever the person is allergic to. So it could be it could be dust, it could be weather, it could be um, animals or pets. It so for 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 allergic, you should be able to tell that from the history. So that means you ask specific things in history. Uh, well, for viral, it is an acute symptom. So they were okay before, then maybe a day or two or three, they got the different symptoms of a running nose, maybe headache, pain. So you should be able to differentiate the two from the history you take. Okay, doctor. Uh, 
This is from Joseph Mwonge. Most patients have encountered most patients I have encountered their sinusitis seems to be a chronic condition. Why? I think he's uh, wondering why it is well, common. Why is it why is it a chronic condition? Uh, um chronic because common? in in the first place, what is causing the allergic uh sinusitis is the is the the body's reaction or the immune system's reaction to the, whatever allergen it, it is. So as long as the person can't keep away from that allergen, then they're bound to come with symptoms. For example, if it's something like dust, if you're still moving in dusty Uganda or wherever you're staying, you're still going to come up with symptoms because your body is reacting to the dust. So it's chronic because the only the best treatment would be for someone to stay away from the allergen that would be the best treatment so with with the other medication that you're giving it's usually for um relief of symptoms so it's not taking away the allergy but it's just causing you to 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 mitigate the symptoms that the patient has presented with that's why it ends up being chronic Okay, uh, last question from Willie says, Doctor, where all attempts have failed on therapies, is there any surgical option? Yes, yeah, so depending on um, what, uh, which sinuses are affected, the different surgical options that you can have that are available. Um, and this can be endoscopic or endoscopic or open surgery although now what is most recommended is endoscopic. So if uh, for, for, for cases where you have persistent disease, it's usually because of obstruction, some form of obstruction of the ostia. This can be opened endoscopically and you have relief of symptoms. So it's just like uh, we had talked about earlier. If someone is having symptoms for, for, for more than three weeks, you should be able to do a CT scan and find out why they are not improving. And this usually the cause can be managed surgically or with addition of medi more medications. Okay, doctor, now I think I also have a question. Uh, I want to understand the importance of uh, steaming like that air when it covers the blanket. Does, also, does it also help in sinusitis? It's dangerous. Um, yes, it does. Um, and this one, the importance is mainly to do with reduction in um, mucosoidema. So with that hot steam, it sort of, um, the hot steam instead causes the, because part of the function of the nose is to warm air right? Warm air that you've inhaled. So when you inhale steam, it's sort of hot air. And the, 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 instead of congestion, you have that the, the blood vessels of the nose will instead constrict. And this in turn helps with the opening up the nose. So it helps with the congestion of the nose. I don't know if you've got me right. Yes, I've gotten you right. I've seen another message in the chat. Thank you, doctor. Uh, Nathan Murungi said, is there any known effect from eating many onions? I beg your pardon? Is there any known effect from eating many onions? Eating many onions to, to the sinusitis? I think. Uh, I have not come across that. Only that uh, because of that pungent um, test of the onion, you, you, in many cases you have an, an, a running nose. But eating many onions, I have not come across that. Okay, we have one well, person has put their hand up. I think I'll allow him to ask the question, Doctor. Alex, okay. please unmute. Hello, good morning, Doctor. Good morning. 
um, Alex Nahawi. Um, I wanted to have more light on why do people with sinusitis present with cough, on, specifically on posterior, or you talked of post nasal drop, I didn't understand that. Mm. Um, then, then another, I wanted you to give more light on why you said frontal sinus, of our mm. frontal sinusitis patients should be admitted, and how about this ethmoid, which has this cranial nerve one, and it is also proximal to the brain, when you compare frontal and ethmoid sinusitis. Then um, another one is like um, I, uh, an answer for the other question, which drugs that, uh, that um, inhibit of us seriously, seriously functioning, one of them was aspirin. That's what I uh, got on what I know, aspirin and benzodiazepine. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, so you're asking why the, the person with frontal sinusitis should be admitted. Why should they be admitted yet the, the one with ethmoid um, sinusitis is not admitted? I wanted to go back to one of the images so that we can be able to see. Okay, so one of the, if you look at the frontal sinus here, you find that you have the anterior table and then the posterior table. And there you also have the brain in, in the anterior cranial fossa. So for someone who has problems with the frontal sinus, you find that, um, there are very high chances of wearing out this bone, which is the posterior table of the frontal sinus. And you find that the most, um, the sinus that gives you the most complications is this frontal sinus. It has to do with um, still this bone being um, eroded. So, and also when you look at uh, the drainage pathway, it has to come all the way from here to, to a meter that is down here. Right. So you, because of because of that technicalities, you can see this is a bit longer. It has, you get obstruction in very in a in a, a more lengthy area compared to that. Your ethmoids are right here, and you find that they drain like in this place here where the you have the meatus. So the chances of of this one causing you complications are higher than the ethmoid sinus. For the ethmoid, it has many alternatives compared to the frontal. This one has many alternatives in that there are more than one, um, when you look at, we call these air cells, there are more than one air cells. So by the time infection affects this one and affects this bone and this bone and this bone, it has given you time. For this one, there are no septations. So you find that it's either wearing out this posterior table or the anterior table. So if it's wearing out this, the, the infection is going to directly go into the brain, into the intracranial cavity. That is why it is, it is more, it, it has a, a higher chances of getting complications. And that is why we would consider admitting someone with a frontal sinusitis rather than the one who has an ecmoidal sinusitis. Okay, doctor. But I thought, I thought because of the cranial nerve one, which passes through that ethmoid bone. I beg your also, I thought because of of cranial or factory nerve that passes through from prate, it could also easily complicate because of uh, access through the nerve. 
Well, I don't have a good image, but for the Cribri form plate, it's in the midline. It's, it's, it's the Cribri form plate is in the midline. Well, these ethmoids are they're on either side of the midline. You understand? Are you getting my point? These ethmoids okay. are on the either side of the, in the midline. That means they're not directly into, or they're not directly below the cribriform plate. Okay. Yes. Thank you. What was the other question um, that you asked? Uh, the other question was, I needed more light on this post-nozzle drop. Uh, yes, the post, so the post-nozzle drip. So you, you, you have the secretions that are coming from your sinuses or from the sinuses of the patient. For example, whatever is coming from the sinuses, from the frontal, from the maxillary, from the ethmoid, from the sphenoid, coming into the nasal cavity. So because of the ciliary movement, you have those secretions going backwards, right? Into the nasal pharynx, okay? So when they go into the nasal pharynx, that's what we call the post-nasal drip. If these secretions are a lot, you may find that the person may not have, um, may not be able to clear them or swallow them fast enough. And these ones will, will try to track into the airway. And that is how you will have the coughing. Okay, thank you, doctor. I've All got right. it. Okay. Any more questions? Yes, there's one from group Murundi was telling us a story of a lady from Mexico. But the question is that I beg your pardon? The question is does aspirin have an effect on ciliary Unfortunately, I have not I've not had the question. Murundi. Jonathan says there was a lady from Mexico with sinusitis. She mm -hmm. had only three children. So he was asking, is it true that aspirin interferes with sinus ciliary function? Um, it's, it's because of the impairment of the ciliary movement. Okay. I think we are done, doctor. Thank you so much. Okay, all right. So uh, I have not yet posted the the notes for the next uh, for the next class. I'll probably post it at like the end of the week. Okay, doctor. All right. Have a good day.